there's a, a worry that the approach to the mind that I've been arguing for might be seen as a kind of cynical view of human nature. That many people are uncomfortable with the idea that the mind is a system of computers designed by natural selection to promote uh, survival and reproduction. It seems like a, uh, a dark view of the uh, human condition. Uh, on the other hand, there are some uh, undeniable facts that uh, motivate this view. One, I, no, I don't think any rational person knowing about modern brain science can deny that the mind is a product of the brain, that the brain is a product of evolution, and that evolution is not guaranteed to produce niceness. It's bound to uh, result in organisms that sometimes pursue their own interests. On the other hand, I don't think of it as a cynical view uh, because of some implications of the three ideas that I think uh, have to be taken together. One of them, computation, uh, leads us to expect that the mind is not just a set of crude drives and reflex, reflexes or um, uh, uncontrollable energy or bad plumbing, but rather we're fitted with intricate, ingenious and powerful software, which is, uh, actually gives room for uh, optimism and human ability to uh, solve our problems. That the idea of evolution leads us to believe that the legacy of biology is not just greed and aggression and lust, a territorial imperative, uh, a rapacious sex drive, and so on. But if you really take it to its logical extension, biology has also given us the kinder, gentler emotions like love, friendship, and a sense of justice. That, that's the legacy of evolution as much as the ignoble emotions. Finally, with specialization, if the mind is not a single substance, but a, uh, a system of a partly autonomous and competing parts, one part of the mind can sometimes outsmart the others. I'll leave it at that, and uh, thank you for your attention. Could you think about everything that happens in the universe as simply materialistic particles obeying their equations of motion? And I strongly think that the answer is yes. I've seen no evidence whatsoever in anything that Stuart said or anyone else to convince me otherwise. I think what happens is we look at problems that seem really, really difficult and we lose our nerve. We tend to blur the distinction between the infinite and the merely really big. The distinction between the impossible and the kind of difficult. Or the distinction between uh, things that we see all around us happening all the time and things that are actually necessary and could not be otherwise. So because we're faced with these problems that are hard, but nevertheless, we see specific examples of hard problems that get solutions, I would say that we should look at the problems of where does love come from, where does morality come from, how does the biosphere evolve, and say, these are hard problems, let's get to work. Thank you. Islam makes very large claims for itself, very large claims indeed. It claims to be the last and final religion, the last and final revelation. When you see bumper stickers, everyone says you can't reduce major things to a bumper sticker. It's not my idea to have bumper stickers saying Islam is the solution. It's a well-known slogan, actually, of parties associated with the Muslim Brotherhood. They say Islam is the solution for everything. It takes care of all your life and the one to come. Sexuality, political economy, banking, Diet, relations with other religions, everything. It's a total solution. What is creepy about the word total? I hope I don't have to tell an audience like this. It's the first five letters of the word totalitarian. It's absolute. It's absolute. It's all-inclusive. It's, it's unanswerable. And oddly, for a religion that makes such large claims, notice another thing about Islam. It doesn't particularly like having these claims questioned or scrutinized. In other words, this, as there, just as there is with all religions, an inverse relationship between the claims they make and the evidence they can produce for them, you must have noticed that, with Islam, a younger religion, and perhaps therefore more in its first flush, there's an extraordinarily strong willingness to say that any challenge to its absolutist claims is by definition profane. And profanity and blasphemy can be the antecedent to very severe punishment and often are, for Muslims and for non-Muslims. And this is not a road of peace in my submission. Nor can we cope with the behavior of objects that move at some appreciable fraction of the speed of light. Common sense lets us down.
because common sense evolved in a world where nothing moves very fast and nothing is very small or very large. The mundane world of the familiar, which I have dubbed middle world. At the end of a famous essay on possible worlds, the great biologist J.B.S. Haldane wrote, Now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of or can be dreamed of in any philosophy. How should we interpret Haldane's queerer than we can suppose? Queerer than can in principle be supposed, or just queerer than we can suppose, given the limitation of our brain's evolutionary apprenticeship in middle world? Could we, by training and practice, emancipate ourselves from middle world, tear off our black burqa, and achieve some sort of intuitive, as well as just mathematical, understanding of the very small, the very large, and the very fast? I genuinely don't know the answer. But I'm thrilled to be alive at a time when humanity is pushing against the limits of understanding. Even better, we may eventually discover that there are no limits. Thank you very much. We are physical beings in a physical universe that follows physical laws. There are truths to be discovered about how our actions benefit us and how our actions harm us. This is simply true. We don't need another mind. This is about the interaction of minds, but we don't need some transcendent mind to dictate what is true. We discover what is true about the reality that we inhabit. God or not, soul or not, we can choose everything on the list that Cliff just talked about, about being good to each other and building a productive society and caring and loving and trying to end poverty, trying to end oppression, and trying to build a better society. We can do all of that just because it's the right thing to do. There's no evidence for a soul. In fact, there's good evidence against it. There's no evidence or not enough evidence um, of the various God claims that are out there, or not any particularly good evidence, at least that I've been made aware of. But I could be wrong. And tomorrow, I could find out that there is a God, and that I do have a soul. And it wouldn't change very much for me as far as how I end up living my life, because I've already come to good, good reasons to do things. Now, I'm open to being corrected on them, but what's going to correct me is reason and evidence, not appealing to a God. And if people have asked me, well, what are you going to do if you die and you end up standing before God? Hey, I tried. I used my brain, I followed the evidence where it was, and by the way, if your character is actually accurately depicted in the Bible or the Quran, I don't want nothing to do with you. I'm already morally superior to you. I already care more about people than you do. I know. I've never sanctioned slavery, never sanctioned genocide. Gods have. That the premise of this debate is in some sense inappropriate um, because it, it suggests two things. First of all, it suggests that Islam is something special, and it isn't. It's not special at all. It's one of a thousand religions that have, or more that have existed since the dawn of humanity, all of which claim divine revelation, all of which claim perfection, all of which contain, can, uh, proclaim infinite knowledge, uniqueness, beauty, etc. So Islam is just a religion like any other religion. And there's no difference. It's, it's, it proclaims just as the Rig Veda did and Akhenaten in ancient Egypt that the universe had a beginning, nothing special. Okay? It, there's, there's absolutely nothing special. So the question is, Islam as one of a thousand religions, all of which make the same claims, but mutually con inconsistent ones. So one of the things we know is, of these thousand religions, they all make mutually inconsistent claims, so they can't all be correct. In fact, at best, one of them can be correct, because they're not, they're not consistent with each other. So that means a priori, just a priori, and I know, you, know, like that, you like that term instead of a posteriori. I've heard you say that. A priori, Islam has a probability of 0.1% of being correct, because it's just one of a thousand religions, and one of them is, it, 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 at, at most is correct. 
But since they all make the same claims, it's probable that none of them are correct. So, that's, so treating Islam specially is inappropriate. Then atheism is somehow, as has been described as speaker, a belief system. It's not a belief system like, like uh, Islam or Judaism or Christianity or the Norse myths or, 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 or Zeus or Thor or any of the other uh, myths that have been created throughout human history. It's all it's saying is, it's not a belief system. It's saying, you know what? We don't choose to believe that stuff because there's, it's not sensible. So it's not saying we believe X. It's saying, well, this, this myth is inconsistent with this myth, or this myth is inconsistent with what we know about the universe, and therefore, it's unlikely to be true. So what atheism is, is just saying, this is unlikely to be true. It's not a belief system. So to compare one versus the other is, of course, false. It's a false premise. So to wrap up, let me just say that, that none of what I've just said should be construed as a denial of the importance of ethics in our lives, or even the importance of, of spiritual experience. You can be someone who's deeply committed to transforming your moment-to-moment -moment perception of the world and use techniques like meditation and fasting, and, and you can go into a cave for a year and be a mystic if you want to. None of that requires presupposing anything on insufficient evidence, and none of that requires that we lie to ourselves or to our children about our state of knowledge about the world. And the problem I have with religion, both at every point on the spectrum, from moderate to extreme, is that it, it stands as a, a permanent denial of the possibility of developing a truly rational, modern, open-ended discussion about the nature of our subjectivity, about the possibility of ethics and spirituality uh, truly in conformity with our rationality as it exists now. Uh, every religious person, every person who's committed to still being a Christian or a Jew or a Buddhist uh, is essentially giving tacit endorsement to the religious divisions in our world and, and essentially saying that, that we need some measure of mythology, we need some measure of fairy tale, we need to pretend on some occasions that we know things we do not know. And it's simply untrue. So I think that's probably enough to get us started. Thank you. Do people understand that science is more a process than a list of answers? That's a separate issue from whether the public requires an answer to something. Um, sorry, whether the public comes to doubt the value of science because a result changes from one week to the next. And with regard to science being a process, that's just a missing part of the science curriculum in K through 12. That's got to get in there somehow. We get textbooks and there's a problem at the end of the chapter and there's an answer to it and you got to get the answer and, there's, and you start to value the answer rather than the process that would lead to that answer or another. So, so uncertainty as well as ambiguity are not elements of a science curriculum but they clearly need to be. Otherwise you're incapable of thinking in meaningful ways about the frontier of science. Until they get to that age, it's the parents' responsibility and do duty. you teach them you that, may not share that. Be punished. You may not share that, but that is my religion. That is the way I have been brought up. And I have I bring that child into this world, I educate him, I give him everything. It's my right to make sure that I bring him and I, I take issue with that. You think that it's wicked. Well that's your point of view. I know that's gonna make him a better human being. And what's missing is when you talk about faith, you don't look at what faith teaches. First and foremost, what faith teaches is that Listen, you're a human being, so respect your fellow human beings. And I think that's an important point that you don't want to discuss. What is the penalty and that is for the apostasy? Thing that you fail to discuss, and that's why you've got those prejudicial views about faith. With what respect. is the penalty for apostasy? What do you teach the children will happen to them if they give up the Muslim faith? Well, let's bring Can the I, debate back into Britain. What is the penalty for apostasy? But what is the penalty for apostasy? What is the penalty for leaving the Muslim faith? Um, to be honest, I cannot back that point up. Dr. Mukadam, what is the penalty for apostasy? And, well, um, before... Uh, we keep well, coming down this apostasy... Well, 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 give us a quick answer on what is the penalty for apostasy. If it was an Islamic country, you very well know, if it's an Islamic country, then the Sharia is very clear. Apostasy is dealt with the death penalty. Thank you, that's all I want to Now, first of all, it's the same God, okay? 
God of Islam and God of the Old Testament. It's the same, Allah is the same as the God of the, it's the same. So hold that aside for the moment. Hold that aside. What he did not know is that of all stars that have names, two thirds of them have Arabic star names, okay? Now, I don't think that's the point he wanted to make. I think he, 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 he didn't quite get that. And so, he, you know, here they go. I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. Not all stars have names, but two thirds of those that do have names have Arabic names. There we go, okay? There they go. And you might say, well, how did this come to pass? What, where did that come from? What was going on? Because if you think of the Middle East now, and it's not where, you're not saying, hey, these are folks naming stars. You go back a thousand years, Islam, 800 to 1100. In that period, which is generally called the golden age of Islam, of Islamic science, golden age, true gold. There was no greater golden age in the history of the world before or after. When you look at the sum of advances that came out of that period in Baghdad, algebra was invented in that period. Algebra is itself an Arabic word. Algorithm is an Arabic word. Our numerals are Arabic numerals. You ever wonder why? You ever stop and think why they're called Arabic numerals? In that period, mathematics took great leaps and bounds. Agriculture, engineering, medicine, navigation. 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 Star maps were made to assist navigation. Astrolabes were, create, were crafted. Then it all stopped. It ended. It ended. If you're a historian, typically you, are, you're, you, are, you focus on history as marked by changes of kings and leaders and wars. That's the lens through which many historians look at the past. And so if you ask people, they'll say, oh, the Mongols sacked Baghdad, and so that's why it all ended. If that were the only force operating, then later, when the Islamic culture rose, you would still see this tradition of scientific um, uh, uh, innovation. But it has not recovered. It has not come back at all compared to what was going on in that 300 years. And what you do is you, you read the writings of al-Ghazali, who is a, a Muslim cleric, and he, he was to Islam what St. Augustine was to Christianity. What he did was he taught you how to be a good Muslim. He taught you how to read the Quran and how to obey the commands. That, because back then, people were just interpreting it for themselves. He came along. He was a, an academic scholar. He interpreted the Quran. He said, this is how you must do it. First has social influence and then political and cultural influence and basically his interpretation took over. And in that interpretation, it included the perspective that the manipulation of numbers is the work of the devil. This cuts the kneecaps out of any mathematical advances that would unfold. Math is the language of the universe. If you take that out of your personal equation, you no longer contribute to the advance of human understanding of that universe. And that absence of Muslim presence in the frontier of science persists to this day. Take a look at the Nobel Prize from 1900 to 2010. I can do this, do this for the, for the Jews, for example. How many Jews in the world? There's like 15 million tops, tops, 15 million out of 7 billion people. These are the numbers of Jews who have won the Nobel Prize in the Sciences. 25% of the Nobel Prizes. We have a Jewish person in the audience, congratulations, okay, <laughs> fine, okay. <laughs> this is rightly something to be extraordinarily proud of. The traditions of Jews in the 20th century is one of, of education and scholarship. Uh, in earlier centuries, it was one of very strict 
sort of uh, um, uh, a study of the Torah, did not involve the natural world. This was a later emergence of the Jewish culture to exhibit this. Let's look at the numbers for Islam. So these are Jews. There are 15 million Jews, 25% of the Nobel Prizes. There is 1.3 billion Muslims in the world. These are the numbers. Two and a half. Okay, I'll give you three if you really want to include economics as a full number there, okay? <laughs> if you got to give it a full number, okay, I'll, okay. <laughs> now, for me, by the way, you can analyze this in any number of ways. There are 50 times the number of Nobel